Uh, hope everybody is doing well this morning. You should already be in your Bibles to Psalm 51. We are going to grab a gear and a half this morning. Thank you, Beth, for reading that for me. And uh, first thing I want you to do is on the back of your notes, the sermon notes, there are three points, but I have about eight that we're going to go through. We're going to break down this psalm together quickly, and then we're going to sort of turn gears or turn directions and change gears a little bit and unpack this thing in a little bit different of a way than we're probably familiar with. The first aspect of this psalm, the very thing David opens up with, is a cry for mercy and forgiveness. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. So he's begging God. He's coming before the Lord in prayer, and he's saying, God, give me mercy and forgive my sins. The second thing that he says is he admits to wrongdoing, and he also admits to the righteousness of God. For I know my transgressions, verse 3, and my sin is ever before me. And against you and only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words. David said, against you I've done this evil and I have sinned and my sin is always before me so that you may be justified. What did he just say here? I realize I am completely unrighteous and I'll unpack this in just a minute. But you are righteous. So he starts off with a cry to God saying, give me mercy and forgiveness. Then he admits that he sinned and that God is righteousness. Then the third thing, David admits what God desires and how God works. Verse 6, behold, you, O Lord, delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. What's God delight in? Truth and wisdom. What did, what did David do? He lived in a lie. He took a wife or a woman that was not his wife, then secretly had her husband killed so that he could look like he brought a widow into his household to cover the sin that, she, that Bathsheba had become pregnant with. He wanted to look like a wise, loving, benevolent king. So he fudged the circumstances to make it look like he was awesome. And he realizes in the process of repenting of his sin, he says, God, I've not been truthful. I have not lived by the way you've called me to live. This brings about the fourth thing. David cries for cleansing and restoration. So he cries out for mercy. He admits wrongdoing and God's righteousness. He admits what God desires. And then he cries out to be cleansed and restored because he knows I've not done it. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice and hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. This is a man begging, desiring with all of his soul to be clean before the Lord. Then you get my, one of my favorite parts of this, this entire psalm. A cry, or point number two on your outline, point number five for mine. A cry for sustained intimacy with God. Cast me not away. David comes to the realization of sin and realizes that he should be pushed out from God. That, that his sin should separate him from God. He says, don't cast me away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. In fact, restore to me joy that's in salvation and uphold me, uphold me, pick me up with a willing spirit. He's crying out for a renewed and sustained intimacy with God. And then this prompts a declaration of worship. Number six, he declares that he will worship. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. My tongue will do what? It will sing aloud of your righteousness. I'm going to break away for a second just address this. One of the privileges we have as a church is to praise God in a corporate standing with all of the people of God. We, at the top of our lungs, we can sing to the righteousness of God. We can talk about His mercies and we can gather together and say the same thing David said here. Then I will stand in the assembly and I will sing your praises. My lips will not be silent. 
Can I just like sort of bum some people out real quick? Maybe, hopefully not. I was on the drums beating myself to death in there, so I heard nothing. But were you singing praises to God this morning? Or were you watching other people sing praises to God this morning? Did you participate in worship as one body? Or did you let somebody else take your job? Again, all I heard was boom, 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 boom. I heard nothing from you guys because I'm sort of like a cave back there. But that said, take every opportunity you have to do what David did here. Declare that you will worship the Lord. Okay, moving back on to the sermon. And admission number seven, he admits inadequacy in worship. Check this out, verse 16. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it to you. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Oh God, this you will not despise. What did David just realize? Since killing Uriah and sleeping with Bathsheba and bringing her into my household, I have offered sacrifices, but my heart has not been humble and contrite to you. I covered my sin. I arrogantly took credit and wanted people to think I was awesome because I brought the pregnant widowed Bathsheba into my house, but I didn't tell anybody that I made her pregnant and that I made her a widow. Instead, I wanted everybody to praise me. And then I went and offered bulls and sacrifice. And I tried to go through the motions of the Old Testament worship life. None of us go through the motions of the New Testament church life, do we? While we continue to sin and to cover our sin and to hide it. See, this is what David realized as he's confessing to the Lord. He goes, I I haven't been worshiping you. I've just been going through the motions. What you desire is not what I've been offering. And this prompts into him a request. Number eight, a request for enablement of proper worship. He begs God to help him worship. Do good in Zion. In your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem, God. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. What David is essentially saying here is, God, I need your help. I've done it my own way, and none of that's been accepted. Everything I've done has just been me doing it by my power and the way I wanted to do it. And it's useless worship. So then he says, God, you build it up. Because in fact, I tore Jerusalem down by doing this thing with Bathsheba. In fact, I led to some of my own men dying to try to murder Uriah. I participated in killing the people I'm supposed to protect. David realizes I was tearing down the walls of Jerusalem. And now he asks God to restore it. See, Psalm 51 is one of these passages that immediately resonate within us. When you read it or I read it, here's what goes through my mind. I wrote that. Nothing in the Bible is so transparent to my heart as that Psalm and Psalm 23. Amen? When I read Psalm 23, I'm like, yes, yes, and some more yes. And then when I read Psalm 51, I'm like, that's, yep, that's all me right there. And then I read Chronicles, I'm like, I I don't know what to do with this. I mean, truthfully, right? There's parts in the Bible Bible where we're like, I I don't know what to do with this. How does this relate? How does this prompt my worship? That's just because we're ignorant. And we haven't spent enough time in the Word of God to let it feed us. But from the first day I read Psalm 1, Psalm 23, and Psalm 51, those have resonated within my heart. I want to be a tree planted by the rivers of water that bears fruit in its season and not like the chaff which the wind blows away. I don't want to face judgment. I want to be the guy in Psalm 23 that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you do prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. And you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. And surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in God's house forever. And our hearts are like, yes, that's it. That's what I want. And then we read Psalm 51 and we're like, I need to say yes, but I really don't want to, but I am that jacked up and then some. But when I read Psalm 51, it resonates within me. Why does it resonate within us? 
because of the brutal honesty that David is addressing his sin. You see, Psalm 51 resonates within us for two reasons. The first reason is because we know we sin. We know we sin. And so when we read Psalm 51, what you have is David admitting his failure. But here's why it's so provocative to us. What we typically do as people is we blame somebody else for our failures. It's always somebody else's fault for why this has happened in my life. I mean, this is modern therapy or counseling today. If it's outside of the Bible, outside of biblical instruction, tell me about your childhood. I remember reading this as a police officer. I was going through some investigation classes and was reading a book on sociology and, and how prisoners got to where they were at. And this guy's doctor, uh, his dissertation from the University of Chicago was basically based upon the idea that every inmate in prison is there because something negative was done to them as a young one. So all these uh, pedophiles and, and violent sexual offenders had violence done to them. And so we should maybe think about letting them go because it was just a crime that was done to them. You see, when your marriage gets tough, you blame your spouse, right? Don't be so holy in here. When, you're, when you get passed over for a promotion, it's because no one saw how awesomely awesome you were. They just, that other person brown-nosed or kissed up or sucked up, and so that's why they got promoted. My boss did not see how great I am. When your children get into something that's jacked up, we blame their friends, not the choices my children made. Here's the way I grew up. If I did something stupid, I got blamed for it. And my friends knew to get away as quickly as possible because we were all going to catch it together. Like, my dad was equal opportunity when it came to punishing everybody. Like, I'm just not going to care which one of you did it. All of you get to pay the penalty. You're like, all right, we need not be at my house when this happens from now on. But look at how we handle this. We always want to blame somebody else for our sins. Do you see David doing that? Not at all. This is the contrast between David and Saul. Saul gets called out on his sin, and he says to Samuel, yeah, 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 but you didn't come on time, and the people were leaving. All right, read it like a real person. Read it like there's a real person in this story. You're blaming me for offering sacrifices? Did you not see the people leaving, Samuel, and where were you? Don't put this on me. Who's ever had an argument with their spouse like that one? To where you know you're in the wrong, but you're like, don't put your hand up. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> but you just wrecked me. Where was I at? <laughs> First hand that went up was my wife. <laughs> yes, Darren's that way. Um, but check this out. We always think that the other person is the fault. And we want to immediately blame them for our own actions. But David gets called out by Nathan. He gives a punishment that should happen to the guy who, you know, stole the sheep and sacrificed it to feed his friend, even though he had many sheep that he could have done that with. And then Nathan goes, you are that man. And David goes, I have sinned. I mean, it's like that. He doesn't even wait. He doesn't try to blame it. Yeah, but you didn't see how hot Bathsheba was. Or how dumb Uriah was. He didn't deserve her. She's like pro ball. He's peewee. He should not have married that chick. She should never have said, yes, I was just liberating her from an ugly husband. He doesn't say any of that. Some of you need to wake up this morning. <laughs> Tough crowd. Instead, he says, I have sinned. All right. Stretch it out for a second. We're going to do some math, which is my personal love language. And we're doing math with philosophy. I want to show you what typically happens. So somebody throw my first point up here. All right. Ah, oh, they left B off. So you got to write this in for me. A is my desire plus B, my sin, equals C, I'm guilty. All right. My desire plus my sin equals guilty. This is the correct formula for how we become guilty. I desired something. I did it. I'm now guilty. Everybody with me? I'm going to take objections at this particular moment. Anybody need me to clarify this? Okay. Now this one, I expect all of us to get lost for a second, depending upon how it looks. D, how many letters are we going to add? It's going to go up to like G. But anyways, I don't know. D is outside temptation. That's me tempting Beth. But B is Beth sinning. 
But because I tempted her, we think E should happen, not guilty. We think if somebody tempts me, or somebody caused me to do this, and I sin, I shouldn't be held accountable for this. Because I got tempted in this. Or I got led astray in this. You shouldn't hold me accountable. I shouldn't have to pay the penalties for this. I, don't go on to the next one. Just wait. Let me tell you a story about this. Still aggravates me. I am over 13 years removed from this one situation, and I still pined over it while I was typing it up this week. 13 years ago, or maybe it's 14 now, I was policing, and I'm in an area that's a high crime, high drug area, and I'm hiding in the dark. Wearing all black, I'm in the bushes, and I got my binoculars on, and I'm checking this out, and I watch a, a drug act, a transaction go down. And I watch the individual come away from me. Now, I know these guys are faster than I am, because at this point, I've fallen in love with Big Macs, and they love me as well, so they're not really leaving my body. And so uh, I was getting smoked by just about everybody I was running after. So I decided I'm going to wait for them to come to me, and then I'll just tackle them when they come by. So I didn't tackle this guy. But, so he's walking towards me, and as he walks, walks towards me, now I saw the whole transaction go down. I said, hey, can I talk to you? Yeah, you can talk to me. You don't have any guns, drugs, knives, weapons on you, anything illegal, do you? He goes, no, no, not at all. So you don't mind them, then I search you. No, no, not at all. So I find drugs on him. I find crack cocaine, pipe, lighter, everything he's going to need. Even he had Brillo pad in his hand. Just Google it later on. But <laughs> as far as all that's going down, so I arrest him, take him to jail. I got a, a, a possession of cocaine. And some months go by, we're in court. We're sit I'm sitting on the stand. I testified to everything I just told you. Then he gets up on the stand. I was like, ooh, this is a new one. Never do I see the perpetrator testify. So I'm like, interesting. Let's see what happens here. He goes, wasn't mine. I was carrying it for a friend. <laughs> and the jury was like, good argument. He didn't see him smoke it. Possession doesn't mean you have to smoke it. Possession just means you possess it. Like, in your hand, in your pocket, in a pocket purse, purse in the car you're driving, in the house you're in. You don't have to prove intent, but the jury was like, no, no. He said he would carry it for somebody else. And we believe him. Not guilty. And then the, the chairman, uh, the foreman of the jury comes up to me afterwards and goes, do you know why you lost that case? Because <laughs> people are stupid? <laughs> I don't know. He said, and I actually said that to him. So after he caught his breath, then he turns around and says, it was because... Um, Two reasons. You didn't prove intent and you didn't fingerprint the cocaine. How do you fingerprint a powdery substance with powder? Just dwell on that one later on. That's not how fingerprint powder works. So I'm just like, you got to be kidding me. And I was just sitting there thinking, I was realizing these folks could care less that he was in violation of the law. In their mind, what brought about criminality was if you had intent to use it. Not that you actually violated it. And that you had to prove that that person really wanted to do danger with it or harm with it. This is this formula right here behind you. Behind me. See, this is what we want to do. We want to say look, I was carrying it for somebody else. Yeah, I did this. Yep, I did wrong, but it was really this other person's fault. But check this out. When you try to blame it on somebody else, you actually admit wrongdoing. The moment you admit wrongdoing, you're in trouble. New formula. My desires plus an outside temptation still included my sin, and therefore I'm guilty. This is the actual formula for how we incur sin. Someone tempting us does not make us un, not, or not guilty or no longer responsible for our sin. You are responsible for your sin because you did it and you actually desired it. The reason you fail, fell in temptation is because it seemed appealing to you. And Eve saw that the fruit was desirable for eating and desirable for knowledge. And she ate it. Yes, Satan was tempting her. But she ate it. And Adam was offering her up to see if she, what death looked like. So he let her eat it first. And then he's credited with the sin because it looks like he's a mastermind trying to figure out, what does this death look like? Do I get a new one if she goes? I don't know, but for some reason, God blames him instead of Eve, and she ate first. Why does God blame him? Because he observed the whole thing. 
He could have said, look, Satan tempted Eve. Eve tempted me. That's two temptations removed. I shouldn't be held guilty for this. That's two different attacks coming in. God's like, no, 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 no. You are the guilty one for this. Eve was deceived. You're to blame. Wow, that escalated quickly. That's the exact opposite of how we argue today. We tend to argue that everybody else is responsible for our sins. I just want you to know this formula, you need to write this one down in your Bible. Remember it before you go to justify something you do. Because typically we're, in, we're acknowledging that we're sinners and then we're going to try to blame it on somebody else. What we're really trying to avoid is punishment. And this, uh, we've got one more formula. This is the correct one. Outside temptation, D, plus F, that is love for God, plus G, that is righteousness, equals E, not guilty. That's how you get a not guilty verdict. Now, we're not talking about you making yourself sinless. No, 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 no. You still got to be saved by Jesus Christ. I'm just talking about how do we know when something's sin or something's not sin? Well, for something you do, for it not to be sin, it needs to be loving God and acting righteously. If what you do is not loving God and acting righteously, then it's not righteous. It's a perverted desire that you're justifying and blaming it on somebody else. Everybody with me now? Do I need to like unpack that anymore? Did I? Because I, I'm not saying you guys are dense. I'm just saying I'm terrible at communicating sometimes, especially math on a Sunday morning. So everybody still with me? Okay, cool. Now, here's the next thing. If we realize that Psalm 51 speaks to us because we all know we're sinners, it also speaks to us for a second reason. Because we desire to be free from our sin. Next point, please. When you look at this here, or eventually, we desperately desire forgiveness. That's all it's going to say behind me. We just desperately desire forgiveness. When you read Psalm 51, the reason it resonates in our heart is because we know we're sinners and we want to be free from our sin. And that desire to be free from our sin is why we blame other people. Because we're hoping to avoid the punishment. Roman, or Hebrews 10, 26 through 27 says this. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Let me just break this up real quick. Once you and I hear the gospel, go a little simpler. Once somebody identifies that we have sinned, we now fear punishment. Once we fear punishment, we want to avoid that punishment. So we either try to blame it on somebody else because wrongly, the, all the math I just went through, we think that we're going to be found not guilty. The reality is we just admit we're guilty and we're just hoping to avoid the penalties, which in a court system may work, but in the court system of heaven, not so much. Jesus doesn't care that you lop or lob your uh, problems on someone else. You still committed those sins. But when we read Psalm 51, you know what David does? He just sets them before the Lord. He too fears judgment. That's why he sinned. That's why he said, I have sinned when Nathan said, you're that man. David goes, I have sinned. His heart confessed it to the Lord. And then when we read Psalm 51, we get to see what was going on in his mind there in that particular passage. We get to see at that moment in his life that he was letting all of his sin hang out before the Lord to try to find forgiveness and mercy in the Lord, which is why that's the first thing he starts with. Have mercy on me. Now, your Bible is going to use three different words for what David wants mercy for. My news is it this way. Transgression, iniquity, and sin. The three words. I'll give you the verse here. I think it's verse three or four. He says, Ch -ch -ch. For I, verse three, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Go up to verse two. Wash me from my iniquity. All right, here's these three words in a nutshell. Do you want to know what to do with your sin, with the fact that you realize that we are afraid of, a, of judgment coming to us? We don't run away from God. We don't cast our sins on another person. Instead, we bring it out before God, and we beg the Lord based upon a promise he's already given to us. 
that if we confess our sins before him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. Remember that from 1 John? If we lay our sins before Christ, he takes it away. So this is exactly what David does. By saying iniquity, he starts off, verse 2, by saying he's, he has iniquity, he starts off by saying, this is rebellion from who I am. The Hebrew for it just means rebellion from who I am. He says, I am the wrong person. You might want to write that down beside your Bible. I'm going to walk you through how to acknowledge your sin from the scripture. I am the wrong person. Then he says, I have transgressed. Transgress means to trespass, to go beyond what is right, to be in the wrong place. I am the wrong person. I am, the, I am in the wrong place. And then he says, I have sinned. What sin? To miss the mark, to do the wrong thing. I am the wrong person, I am in the wrong place, and I am doing the wrong thing. Is that not in stark contrast to how Saul identified his actions? He tried to blame it on everybody, tried to own, justify it. Look, I didn't do anything wrong. You weren't coming. I did this to keep people from leaving. I had to get God's permission for fighting and for battle. And so everything makes sense. Look, I did everything unbiblical, but in my mind it makes sense. So if, prove it, Samuel. Let me know it's okay. And he goes, the kingdom's being ripped away from you because of this. Because you don't care what God says. Because you want to do it your way. It's being ripped away from you. David gets called out on his sin. And he goes, I am the wrong man in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. Zero justification of his sin. That's why God called him a man after his own heart. This is why when we read this psalm, the reason it resonates in us is because we desperately desire forgiveness. But because we don't know what it means to seek forgiveness, we always try to justify our stuff. I can tell you as a pastor... The amount of conversations I've had with people over their sin, it's every day of the week. Not a free day goes by where I'm not going to talk with somebody about their sin. But here's what happens in this. We want to justify it. So here's what I do. I begin to take them through scripture and argue. I literally argue with people from the Bible that what you're doing is sinful. You can't tell me I am doing anything wrong. You're right. I can't, but the Bible can. Because God created us. He has the right to speak over us. He has the right to define what is right and wrong. Therefore, he can command us to do it. At my core, though, I don't want to. I'm not talking about you. At my core, I don't want to do what God tells me to do. Because it doesn't seem fun. Watched a couple of videos on this and made me order the book called The Juvenilization, Juvenilization of the Church. I'm like, well, what's up with this? He says, check this out. Youth ministry has predominated or pushed the church to the point that it's all about fun and games and wooing people in with entertainment and keeping them with bigger entertainment. And having to go bigger and bigger and bigger with the entertainment or people leave and having to outdo the folks down the road from us. Because we, didn't, we know that the generation today, all of them, everyone alive, if you're in this room, you're in a generation, so these generations today don't really want Jesus or every seat would be full in every single church throughout the world. Come on, there's like nearly 8 billion people, 7 billion people in the world. We got like 15 million Baptists and 300 million Americans. 15 million Baptists. We're one of the bigger denominations. What's that say? People don't want Jesus. They don't want the church. They don't want anything to do with this. So we're like, you know, we got a game plan. What we'll do... We'll entertain people to death. 
Let's start doing radical fun stuff. We'll do this conference on a uh, preaching series on sex, how to have a better sex life. Let's do a preaching series on how to manage your money. Let's do another one on here's how we can have fun here. Let's do one event after another event. Okay, how much does your Bible address how to have a sex life? How much does it address living in the world and being like the world? Doesn't it command the exact opposite? Be in the world but not of it? Does not Jesus require us to look differently? Is not the process of sanctification the Holy Spirit indwelling us and changing us? I am so tired myself of pursuing a broken Christianity that I refuse to be a part of it in whatever church I'm a part of. And we're all broken, including myself. But that is not an excuse to stay broken. It's the motivation to go to the Lord because if after hearing the truth we walk away from it and do our own thing, there's a terrifying fear and expectation of a fury of fire and judgment. That's that old preaching of, the, of years ago, right? When we don't do anymore, hellfire brimstone. We just want to massage your conscience today. That's what the average preacher does today. Moral, therapeutic, deism. Come to God because God's whole goal is for you to feel good about yourself. I thought it was to kill me. Give me a new body, new spirit, new body later at the, at the rapture or resurrection. I thought that was his goal. That I would be in awe of him all the days of my life. That my life would bring him glory and honor and praise. Do you know what happens when we as a church begin to focus on entertainment instead of repentance? We have to now start blaming our sins on everything else. And I found this to be true. Guys, I'm not thinking of a soul in here. It's me. I found this to be true in me. I want to blame my sins on the culture around me. Struggle with lust a little bit? It's the magazines as you're checking out. It's what's on TV. It's what's always on the movies. Struggle with greed? Well, think about it. Everybody always has something better than what you have. Struggle with pride? I work harder than they do. Shouldn't I be rewarded? And on and on and on. We always justify our sins. Or I'm just unique and I'm the only one that justifies my sins? And none of you do. Who justifies their sins? Hey, Tom's like, yep, that's true, Darren. <laughs> no, that's not what he was doing. <laughs> Were you doing that? Okay. So who is unique with me as we justify our sins? Look around. Own this. All right, even better. We're going to have some fun here. If you justify your sins, stand up. I was already standing. All right, look around. Scan everybody. Take it in. Y'all a bunch of heathen. I'm one of them. I'm just saying like this. We a bunch of heathen. All right, now sit down. Let me tell you what this means. You're going to hurt the fire out of each other. You're going to wound each other. You're going to sin against each other. We're going to abuse one another. Instead of shooting the wounded, step forward and realize this one line that has radically transformed how I view sin. And the Lord just let it sink into my soul a couple years ago. It's from Psalm 51. Against you and only you have I sinned. Well, Darren, that's proud. No, no. Flip it. You haven't sinned against me. I don't sin against you. We sin against God. So instead of shooting one another, this allows us to give grace to each other, which is the thing we want more than anything else. When we gather as a church, what we want more than anything else is grace and mercy. We want to be forgiven. But remember, Jesus told us to forgive first, not to get people to forgive us first. Psalm 51 requires us to go to the Lord. It's an example of going to God and confessing our sins before him. In turn, 
that means we should show people mercy because he showed us mercy. I have had a lot of people do a lot of mean things to me since I've been in the pastorate. It's not me. Yeah, sometimes, let me clarify that. I am a moron who sins. And so sometimes I just go really dumb and do dumb things that are sinful. So if you see me doing that, in the love of Jesus Christ, would you help me not by coming up to me and saying, yo, what are you doing? This is insane. Just like David's men did. But David just didn't listen to it. I want to listen to it. I want you to listen to it. We're, we all need to be the opposite of David in that case. When our men come up to us, when our peeps come up to us and tell us, hey, you're off the rails here. Are you really asking to number Israel? Are you really asking for Uriah's wife? Don't you know this is not legit? We need to be like, you are right. Do you know that's in the Bible, by the way? Do you remember reading that, that David's men confronted him? See, the greatest thing about being a church together, outside the fact that we get to praise Jesus Christ together, is we get to hold each other to a standard that no one else wants to hold us to in love. The world wants to hold you to a standard of righteousness because they want to devalue the name of Jesus Christ. They want to take the glory away from Jesus Christ, and they'll do it by calling us out for our sins. And there are many sins that we all commit every single day. And there is no love in that. They're not trying to spur us on to love Jesus Christ. It's the exact opposite. They're trying to devalue the glory of Christ. But the church, the church calls each other out in love to say, hey, you are a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. Let us walk in the Spirit. Let us run in such a way to receive the prize. Lay aside every encumbrance and sin and thing that so easily entangles you. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Our hope is in Him. This is what we do to one another. This is why we do what we do. So I'm just asking you, enter in. Start with the fact we need to address our hearts before the Lord and pull a David. I am the wrong person doing the wrong thing in the wrong place. Bring me back. We sang that song a few weeks ago, right? Bring me back. And that's it. We want to come back to basics. I love guys like John Wooden and Vince Lombardi that would start every season off. John Wooden would teach people how to put socks on. These are 18, 19 year old kids. Didn't our moms teach us how to put socks on, you know, with your underwear and your pants? Never went to school naked one time in my life. Made it all the way to college. Why are you teaching me how to put socks on? Because a stitching seam in the wrong spot on your toe meant a blister. A blister meant not being able to go out as hard as you need to do or not practicing as much as you need to do, which then took away from the mission of UCLA, which is to win a lot of football games. He's a basketball coach. Basketball games. Does UCLA win at football? Anyways, moving on. Vince Lombardi would say, gentlemen, this is a football. Really didn't know we got here without playing football, Coach Lombardi. Why are you telling me this is a football? Church, this is your Bible. This is God's recorded word. This is the only way he's chosen to, spoke to speak to us. Any vision you may have, any audible voice you may have of the Lord that you think is the Lord, must be confirmed through Scripture to align with what Jesus has revealed to us in Scripture. Everything else is, an, is, is Satan or a demon disguising themselves as an angel of light intending to lead you away from the truth. Do you know the truth? Do you know what's in it? See, something simple that we've read 10,000 10, times, and I'll close with this, is Psalm 51. Did you realize that that's how David was repenting though? I am the wrong man in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. Or do you read it, I just do bad things. Occasionally I sin. That's not how David repented. He was thorough in who he was before the Lord and who, who he was was a man who needed God to work 
in him. You know what the story, how the story goes? He did. He forgave him. And Jesus Christ came through the line of David. And we are all saved because Jesus sits on the throne of King David. And then he sits on the heavenly throne. I'm about to lose my stuff here. He stands when his saints are attacked for proclaiming the truth. Is Jesus going to stand for us and welcome us into heaven? Are we living the life that Stephen lived? An obscure figure in the book of Acts, just a few chapters. Yet Jesus stands out of the throne for him to receive him into heaven? That man's faith changed his life. Let your faith change your life by repenting to Christ every single day of the week. David's not crying for salvation. He's got that. Instead, restore to me the joy of your salvation. What the church needs more than anything else, the whole church throughout America right now, I mean, the church is much bigger than America, by the way, but the American church has lost its joy in Christ for joy in stuff. We have pursued stuff more than we have Christ. I'm asking the Lord to take stuff from me so I can walk with him. I want to fix my hope on him. If you want to as well, then let's join together in prayer. Jesus, we ask you, we beg you to restore the joy of your salvation to us by bringing to light the wrong places we are in, the wrong things we are doing, and the wrong thoughts and motivations of our heart. Instead, let us walk in the Spirit and no longer gratify the desires of the flesh. We ask that your fruit of the Spirit would abound in us that we would know you, that we would honor you, that we would obey you, that we would be your people, not just right now, but every moment of our lives. Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that speaks into my mind, into the depths of my soul when I am engaging in a sin and says, stop, don't do this. I thank you for putting songs on my heart of praise when I'm really wanting to be angry and, up, and frustrated and upset over things. How you change my thoughts with just a song that's been going through my mind all week this week. Lord, let my heart, let our hearts be full of your praises. Let us overflow with who you are. If someone is in here, and they are distant from you, then Lord, I ask that they seek me out or Pastor Wes or anyone next to them. Fill the card out in the back of their seat and not leave here without wanting to be engaged again and, and let us have that conversation about how we walk with you, how we love you, how we honor you. For the rest of us, Lord, that come in here every single week, God, change us. Unite us. We're praying for unity, that we would see things the same way, that we would stop fussing and fighting and arguing and gossiping and backbiting. And we don't even realize how much we do this, but this is the only thing we know as Americans is how to complain. Lord, forgive us, especially those who identify as Christians, who lead our country in being critical of everything. Jesus, you walked this planet and you could have been critical of everything instead you identified sin and then gave us an invitation to you to have it washed off Lord let us do the same thing let's be honest and know that there are sins and there are things we do but then God let us be forgiving because you have forgiven us Father, I ask that you would let us see just how much you've forgiven us so that we who've been forgiven much are grateful much I thank you for new hope. I thank you for the privilege of being a part of this body. You are doing some funky things here that stress me out that I know stress this church out. But Lord, we thank you because I am walking with you more deeper than I have ever in my life. I'm hearing the testimonies on Sunday morning and in Sunday school and Wednesday night. People are saying the same thing. 
Lord, you have captured our hearts with your word. Please do not let go of them. Conform us into the posture we need to take before you that we may walk in power and proclaim your glories. Let us walk out of here with boldness and burn bright to how amazing you are to the world around us. Not looking for a fight, but looking for an opportunity to do what you did to the Samaritan woman. Drink from the well that I am and you will never be thirsty again. Lord, let us drink from you and help others do the same. Jesus, I love you. We love you. It's through your holy name we pray. Amen.